Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Ethiopia's army launches a final offensive against the capital of the region at war with the federal government. A 72-hour deadline for surrender issued to Tigray ran out on Wednesday, and the conflict looks set to escalate. Also, Tundulisu, the Tanzanian opposition leader who fled to Belgium after losing last month's presidential election to John Magafuli, calls for the international community to sanction his administration. Lisu says that the vote was fixed, that Magafuli is growing increasingly authoritarian. And in the town of Luxor in Egypt, it feels more like a museum than a thriving tourist hotspot. Following six months of shutdown because of the pandemic, last month's reopening has seen visitors slow to return. But first, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has ordered federal troops to launch what he's called a final offensive against the capital of the Tigray region after a 72-hour deadline for surrender of its TPLF leaders expired. They rejected the ultimatum and their forces have been at war with the army for three weeks now. The violence has claimed hundreds of lives and forced tens of thousands of people from their homes over the border into Sudan. Maria Gerth Nicolescu has more. According to diplomatic sources, federal forces were about 30 kilometers away from Tigray's regional capital, Mekele, earlier on Thursday. We still received no information about the ongoing fighting in Mekele. There is a telecommunications blackout throughout the region, which makes it very difficult to verify and obtain any information about the reality on the ground. Human rights organizations have urged all parties to the conflict to protect civilians. Mekele is home to about half a million people, and the prime minister promised that all precautions will be taken to protect civilians. He urged residents in Mekele to disarm and to stay at home. Both parties to the conflict are now accusing each other of planning to use civilians as human shields. The federal police also accused the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, of planning to massacre non-Tigrayans in Mekele. So far, any attempts for mediation by the international community, and in particular by the African Union, have failed. Ethiopia's prime minister still refused to negotiate with Tigrayan leaders whom he considers as criminal. This conflict has already internally displaced about one million people and the UN has reiterated the necessity to allow humanitarian aid to access the region. Well, in Zimbabwe, up to 40 miners are believed to be trapped underground in a disused gold mine in Bindura, north of Harare. Rescue efforts began after the shaft that they were working in collapsed on Wednesday. Only six men have been pulled out so far. Ryan Truscott has more. One eyewitness told a local news outlet that an explosion was heard at the time the mine shaft collapsed. Ran Mine is near Bindura in the Mazoe Valley, a gold-rich area north of Harare. Rescue operations are continuing, but there are fears that between 20 and 40 miners are still trapped in a collapsed shaft that's now being flooded with mud and water. This gold mine has been operating for more than a century, but as with many large-scale mining operations here, the work was no longer regulated. Here, as in other areas of Zimbabwe, a chunk of mining activity is now undertaken by small-scale artisanal miners, many of them illegal, often using dangerous methods and mercury to extract the gold. A local NGO, the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association, says more than 1,000 artisanal miners operate at Rand Mine at any one time. In a report released today, it said the careless use of explosives at the mine earlier this year had caused damage to houses. Sadly, accidents like this one are becoming more frequent. Just last week, rescue teams had to give up the search for six miners trapped in a flooded gold mine in Esigodini in the south of the country. Burkina Faso's incumbent leader has won a second term. Rock Mark Cabaret avoided a runoff with a large outright majority in Sunday's vote. He won 57.87% of ballots, followed by Eddie Comboigo, the champion of ousted President Blaise Campaore's party. Tundulisu, the Tanzanian opposition leader, has called for sanctions against President John Magafuli. Lisu says that last month's vote, in which he unsuccessfully tried to unseat Magafuli, was fixed. 
He also warns that human rights in the country are under threat under the current government. Lisu says that he received death threats after his loss. He fled to Brussels, where he spoke to our Alex Le Bourdon. After the election on the 28th of October in Tanzania, you decided to flee your country. Why? I did not decide to flee. I was forced to flee. On the 30th of um, October, that is two days after the, the election, or so-called election, uh, police protection, which had had throughout the campaign, was uh, withdrawn. And the very next day, on Saturday, I received two phone calls, uh, which were basically death threats. Three years ago, I survived a terrible assassination attempt. I was shot 16 times. And this time, I was not ready to ignore any death threats. What are you expecting from the international community now? We are asking our Western friends to take a position. They cannot support a government that is killing its own civilian population and justify it on the grounds that it is stable because that, is, that appears to be the current argument by our friends in Europe, in Western Europe. Uh, Hitler's regime was very stable actually inside Germany because he was killing all the opponents. Dictatorships are stable. But what is the price of that stability? Killings, repression, uh, torture, uh, that cannot be, cannot be accepted. John Magufuli's first term was marked by fairly good economic results, but at the same time, we know that Tanzania uh, dropped by 53 positions in the ranking of Reporters Without Borders on press freedom. What is your assessment of this first term? During that period, foreign direct investment fell by 50%. Unemployment has risen. Hundreds, hundreds of business people in Tanzania have been uh, arrested, falsely charged with economic crimes. If you look at the, the, the statistics on paper, they look very impressive. They may look very impressive. But on the ground, everyone is hurting. Now, coming to uh, your question about free speech, about press freedoms, President Magufuli has been a disaster. Newspapers, radio and television stations have been shut down. News, uh, uh, journalists uh, targeted. Political freedoms have been severely restricted. We have been persecuted. I was nearly killed. I was lucky. Others were not so lucky. We have party leaders, uh, party members, party activists who were killed in broad daylight. What are you going to do now? Well, I'll continue the struggle. Tanzania has always been an anchor of stability in a very turbulent region, the Great Lakes region. I want to tell the world that Tanzania matters and they should not allow this obnoxious dictator to destroy the country. Well, the World Health Organization is worried that Africa is not ready to roll out a COVID-19 vaccination drive yet. It would be the continent's largest ever, but Money and logistics means that mass immunisation might not be able to start before the second quarter of 2021. Here, Del Rieu has more. While the world takes hope for promising vaccines, African health officials worry the continent will suffer the consequences of richer countries racing to buy up supplies. We do know that African countries are concerned and hoping that pre-ordering of millions of doses of vaccine by wealthy countries will not disadvantage their accessing supplies. I think this is very much the issue of today that's being discussed all over, especially in the region. According to the World Health Organization, readiness for vaccine rollout across the region is currently at 33 percent, well below the desired 80 percent benchmark. The main obstacles for a wide-reaching vaccination campaign remain cost and logistics. Access to the 1.5 billion estimated doses necessary to vaccinate 60% of the African population would require an investment of over $5.5 billion, an estimated cost that does not include the price of injection material, storage and delivery, and could be much higher if more than one vaccination campaign was needed. Although we have these uh, vaccines that are effective, 
appear to be effective. And as Dr. Moeta has mentioned, the plans to roll them out. This should not stop uh, the uh, uh, research and development of newer vaccines. We don't know yet how long the immunity will last for these vaccines that are coming on. This past week, the number of African coronavirus cases surpassed 2 million, and the WHO warned that the continent is heading towards a second wave of infections. So far, about 21 million tests have been conducted across Africa's 1.3 billion population. And finally, once a thriving tourist city, Luxor in Egypt now feels more like a museum. Despite attractions having reopened last month, tourists are slow to return following the six-month coronavirus shutdown. Communities are finding it hard to get by. The final checks before takeoff. A dawn flight over the Valley of the Kings offers dream views of ancient, eternal Egypt and is popular with tourists. But this morning, only a few passengers have taken their seats. Yeah, actually, we are quite lucky uh, that it's less crowded, uh, but it's not good for our country as well. One person's happiness is another's misfortune. The captain, Kareem, is nostalgic about a time not so long ago. Same time, last year, it was our 35 balloon flying same time. A lot of companies stop now, no more. Because most of people, they afraid to come from Corona and also no more money to come uh, to fly. Everything is expensive. At this time of year, the centre of Luxor city is usually swarming with tourists. The bazaars are lively and the motorboats chug back and forward ceaselessly between the two banks of this ancient city. But for several months now, Mahmoud has had to leave his Dahabia, a kind of pleasure boat, moored by the quayside. In this city centre bar, Allah is adjusting to his new life. For 27 years, he accompanied tourists down the Nile from Luxor to Aswan. Now, he works 16 hours a day, six days a week, to feed his family. In a country where tourism accounts for 12% of GDP, if the health crisis lasts much longer, the pressures could prompt a social crisis too. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Take care.